Well, welcome. I'm so glad you are here. You are in the right place on the Mary Hyatt Show. I am your host, Mary Hyatt. And for those of you who maybe don't know me, this is your first time joining. Welcome. Let me introduce myself. I am a life coach. I am a presidential diamond with doTERRA essential oils. And what lights my heart on fire is really helping women wake up to begin to find their voice and to become fully alive. So every week on my Facebook live show, we are talking about issues that women face, issues like authenticity, vulnerability, issues with accepting the body that you have today, looking at really making peace with food for quieting that inner bully and being able to look in the mirror and say genuinely, I love you, which is hard. And so that's why we're here every week talking about these issues. So I am honored that you are spending the time with me today. I can't wait to get into our topic. What is normal eating? So let's start the show. so excited you are here and today's topic is surrounding normal eating or abnormal eating. We're going to kind of look at both because the other day I was with a good friend of mine and she was telling me about a friend of hers. As women do, they talk about, you know, what's going on with their friends and she said, Mary, you'll never believe what a good friend of mine told me. She said that she apologized for not being really available this summer. And so my friend asked her, you know, why? Well, what's been going on? Have you been really busy? Or, you know, why haven't we been able to, to connect? And, and she said, you know, the truth is, is I've been going on a lot of vacations to the beach this summer. And I know that if I hang out with my friends before I go to the beach, I am going to eat a lot of food that I don't want to eat. A lot of food that is high in calories and is going to make my, myself fat. So she said five days before a beach trip, she basically hunkers down, doesn't hang out with any of her friends and really starts to restrict her eating. You know, it's kind of like that last ditch effort to lose the, the final five pounds before getting in a swimsuit. And she said that she stops eating at five o'clock every single evening, even if she's hungry, she won't allow herself to eat past five. She stops drinking alcohol, and then if for whatever reason she slips up, she makes a mistake, she cheats in that five-day window, she kind of has this formula that she has created in her mind that, you know, like let's say she eats some French fries, for example, that would be on her forbidden food list, then she will make sure that she works out, does cardio, gets on the treadmill for at least an hour and a half so that she burns off all those calories. And then while she's at the beach, she does the same thing. And so she's constantly creating this exchange of, you know, calories in, calories out. And so she was just apologizing for not being around this summer because of that five day period leading up to her time at the beach, she really started to diet, but she didn't call it diet. It was kind of, for her, a very normal behavior. And so my friend looked at me and she said, Mary, I'm so grateful for the work that you do because here's somebody, she goes, my friend, she goes, she's a healthy weight, she's active, she has energy, but she's paranoid about what she looks inside of a bathing suit. And she thinks the only way that's gonna make her feel more confident is if she begins to restrict her food and starts changing her relationship to food. And the sad thing is, that is, not abnormal. The sad thing is, is that that is normal in our culture. The, the normal way of eating in our culture is actually a very disordered way of eating. And I am running right now my Babe Redefined course. And so we had a group call yesterday and the content that we were covering had to, had to do around diet culture. And so on my workbook, as I was handing it to the ladies, there were questions like, you know, how many diets have you been on in the past three years? And what kinds of diet 
behaviors are you still practicing? And for most of us, if we're not on a specific diet, if we're not doing, you know, 10 days to this or 21 days to lose X amount of inches, we don't think that we're on a diet. But the sad thing is, is that even though we are not doing a diet, we're still practicing diet behaviors. We're still in that realm of restricting, of calorie counting, even if we're not you know, on the 30-day plan or a 15-day plan or reading the, the latest diet book. Chances are most of y'all listening on the call today are practicing some diet behavior. And as we've covered before, diets are incredibly harmful. They are, um, oh my gosh, like just psychologically damaging. They are physically damaging, you know, slowing your metabolism down. You know, you, you're not even going to be able to maintain weight loss over a long period of time. It screws with your hormones. It screws with your um, uh, cortisol levels. Everything gets whacked out when we go on diets because it is that deprivation cycle, that starvation cycle, that diets are a form of low level starvation in some form or another. So I posted on my Instagram the other day about what normal eating is and what normal eating isn't. And I had so many people comment on that post on Instagram and they, they kept saying things like, I don't even know what to do with this information. <laughs> like, okay, I hear what you're saying, but I don't even know how to begin to give that up, that diet behavior. And so I wanted to make it really clear on what normal eating is not. What normal eating is not. So if we're gonna define normal eating, let's define what normal eating is not. So normal eating is not eating beyond fullness meaning you know stuffing yourself so much that you can't move. Normal eating isn't avoiding certain foods. Normal eating is not counting anything, not counting fats, not counting calories, y'all not counting macros, not counting proteins, not counting grams, grams of sugar. Normal eating is not any kind of portion control, any kind of measuring, any kind of weighing of your food. Normal eating is not restrictive, it's not obsessive, it's not fear-based, and normal eating does not make you feel like you cheated or that you're bad or that you have to do penance. And normal eating is also not skipping meals. Normal eating is not stopping to eating at certain times, like that, that woman that I was talking about who stopped eating at five o'clock. It's not reading labels, it's not avoiding dessert, it's not feeling guilty if you've eaten dessert or if you want dessert. And this is hard to process because in our minds, all of those things that I just mentioned, you're probably doing some form of those and we have normalized that behavior in our society. That the way we relate to food is very restrictive, is very obsessive. Even people who are quote unquote doing the healthy thing are still practicing these dieting behaviors, eliminating foods, food groups, cleansing, detoxing. All of these are inside of the diet mentality culture. And that's not normal. So I like to think about this in a really, really practical way. Sometimes it can get complicated. And I'm like, let's look at common sense for a hot second. So diets did not exist 100 years ago. Diets did not exist. There weren't diet books. There weren't ways to diet. People weren't uh, looking at um, different bodies and comparing their bodies and looking at this concept of an ideal beauty and thinking, well, I don't measure up to that or I don't live up to that. There wasn't the kind of obsession around the bodies that we have now. And people might argue, well, that's because we were all healthy back then and so we didn't need to diet. And that is actually not the case. There's a ton of research that shows different size bodies. I mean, you think about Renaissance bodies and how they uh, really valued that, the plump figure and the roly-poly stomach and the big breasts, pale skin. You know, bodies have changed over time. 
And you can't just blanket and say people used to be healthy 100 plus and 2,000 years ago, and all of a sudden now we're not healthy, so we need to go on diets. And I have a whole um, section in my course, Babe Redefined, about this, about dispelling a lot of our common myths that we have surrounding fat, surrounding obesity, surrounding diets that we're not going to get in today, but I dispel all of that inside of the course. But what's interesting is that what we're operating with now, this idea of disordered eating that's been normalized is that it's all based out of the fear that we can't trust our bodies, that we need rules, that we can't trust ourselves around food so that we need a diet, that we will listen to literally anyone else's opinion about what we should do to make sure that we lose weight or um, get healthy. And we've stopped listening to our own bodies and we have basically outsourced that because we don't trust ourselves. And so there's this fear, I can't be trusted. So what solution do you have to give me? And so what happens is when we're afraid of our own selves, our own bodies, that our bodies might turn against us, that we can't trust our bodies, then when our mental game gets kind of stuck in that diet mentality, you are right around the corner from your next diet. And that's why we're always in diet behaviors, even if you aren't on a quote unquote diet, you're going to have these diet behaviors. And it's always, you know, you hear people say all the time, okay, I'm going to start on Monday. You know, I'm going to start tomorrow. I'm going to eat this tonight. I'm going to start tomorrow. That there is this sort of good behavior in our society that means that we're dieting. And so we have to kind of justify if we want to eat dessert or if we want to indulge in something or if we want to have a several course meal or have a glass of wine. We always are sort of making an excuse for that, like, well, I worked out really hard today, or I'll work out tomorrow, or I'm going to start my diet tomorrow. We have to justify pleasure. We have to justify what actually is normal eating, because disordered eating has become so normalized that we keep needing to go into that diet mentality. And what happens is, when you know, you guys know this, is that when you have the threat of restricting your diet in some way, restricting your eating, it triggers what is called the last supper. Okay, I wanna hear from you guys. If, you, if you've heard this term before, just comment below, let me know. Have you heard of the last supper behavior? So it, it's exactly what you think it would be in that when you know you're gonna have to give up something, like let's say you're gonna start a diet tomorrow, you're gonna go into last supper behavior, which means you're gonna basically eat everything that you can because you're about to have to give it up. You're gonna eat all the foods that you're about to restrict because you're not sure when you're gonna have them again. And so even the slightest thought that you might be going on a diet tomorrow or next week or you're gonna cleanse or you're gonna detox, all of a sudden it throws you into, even if you haven't even decided you're doing the diet, just thinking about diets triggers, throws you into that last supper behavior. Um, Christy, you said yes. Tina, yes. Trisha, yes. You do this all the time. Lisa, you said I've definitely done this. Yeah, we all have. This is so normal. Like, hey girls, let's go out for some dessert because tomorrow I'm going to start my diet. You know, let me get it all in before I start. And I love this quote from Intuitive Eating. They say, if you tell yourself that you can't or shouldn't have a particular food, it can lead to intense feelings of deprivation that builds into uncontrollable cravings and often binging. And so what happens is that when then you go out to, to binge, right, you go out to have the sort of last supper, then all of a sudden you start thinking, I have no control around food, I have no willpower, I have to go on this diet and look at what I've done and it kind of reinforces all of that thinking and so it sends you on that hamster wheel again of what's the next diet, what's the next solution, what can I do? And this is fascinating, this is a concept that I have been talking um, about with my girls um, in the Babe Redefined course, we have a group coaching that we do every week and we were talking about this yesterday that all of this is exacerbated by the fact that diet culture has now interwoven religious frameworks and values into food. Okay, let me explain this because this is, I feel like this is kind of like a, you know, mind blowing moment, all right? We've interwoven religious frameworks 
and values onto food. And so I kind of started to learn this from my friend and researcher, Emily Contois, and she says, diet culture links good and bad foods with good and bad behaviors and then lumps that into good and bad bodies, good and bad selves. So with this framework, when all of a sudden we make food good or bad, when all of a sudden we attach morality, religious framework onto food, it causes incredible amounts of guilt. So that's why I asked at the beginning, okay, who feels guilty for eating the Halloween candy last night? Or how often are you feeling guilty when you indulge in something sinful like dessert or a glass of wine or a couple cocktails or... I mean, it can get as extreme as you indulge in a carb or you indulge in a forbidden fruit. Um, this attachment of morality, of religious framework onto food is so harmful for us in our relationships with food. And because it hits us like at our deepest fear that we're not good enough, that we might be bad, then we're really susceptible to this kind of um, advertising in the media. So you might have uh, might be thinking, okay, well, how, do, how does this look in the media? You might have advertisements that say guilt-free dessert, which could be like a, a dessert substitution, like a yogurt or um, a chia pudding, for example, low calories, you know, guilt-free. Or you might have something that is sinfully delicious, you might have uh, the language within your girlfriends like, I'm going to have a cheat day. Like I'm cheating, right? There's this kind of like sexuality piece that gets brought in as well as it's tied to religion. So I'm going to cheat. I'm going to eat this and not this because this is good. This is um, good behavior and this is bad. This is bad behavior. So then I am good or I am bad. And so once we start believing that I am bad because I ate the dessert, I ate the cookie, I ate this or this, that creates an incredible amount of shame. When we start identifying our own self as being bad because of our bad behaviors linked to bad foods because of this uh, intersection between religious um, uh, religion and food, it gets all funky up there, y'all. Like, can I get some amens? Can I get anybody who has experienced this? If this is a new concept for you, if this is at all aha, an aha moment, will you just comment below and say like, aha moment, yes. Just let me know, give me some hearts, give me some thumbs up, this is like resonating with you. So now we can't think straight, okay? And so we start looking at calories, we start looking at grams of protein, we start looking at grams of sugar as a morality issue. And ultimately something that makes us good and makes us bad. And with the ever-changing diet and with ever-changing, okay, well now saturated fat is bad and now this is bad and this is okay to eat, but you need to up your fat and down your sugar, but then, no wait, over here, do protein only, no carbs, okay, count your macros. I mean, it's like, y'all, it's crazy making. And that is not normal eating. When we're counting, restricting, weighing, portion controlling, that is not normal. That's not just like, oh, I have freedom and I can just eat whatever because I trust myself and my body and I intuitive listening, intuitively listen. That is, not intu that is not normal eating. Okay, Tina, you're saying yes. Christy, Lisa, Samantha, Julia, Juliana, you guys are all saying yes. Okay, so being on good behavior, like I said, in our culture means being on a diet or participating in diet behaviors. And restraining, restricting, avoiding pleasure. It's kind of this legalistic uh, way of thinking, this puritanical way of thinking that we've tied to food. And y'all, morality should never be linked with food. It is just food. Y'all, it is just food. It is just food. And uh, Emily Contois, who kind of talks about this more and does this interview in my course, it's amazing. And I can't wait to share that with you guys. We get into this more. But my sweet friends who introduced me to Emily, Amanda Adams and Andrew Wilson, who talk a lot about intuitive eating, they say, with intuitive eating, you understand that food is not good or bad. You 
are not good or bad because of what you eat. Food is just food and it has a lot of functions and benefits. You decide when, what, and how much to eat based on your body's hunger and fullness cues and desire to experience pleasure. And so, for example, I was talking with my Baby Redefined Girls yesterday about kale. And we were like, okay, well, how the hell did kale become so popular that everybody is advertising kales? There's like the kale yeah shirt. Um, how is it that kale became like the popular girl in high school when it comes to vegetables? Whereas before, I don't know if you guys remember, kale was just a vegetable that they would put on like the salad bar at Shoney's <laughs> because it wouldn't wilt. And now all of a sudden, you better eat kale or you're not healthy, you're not good. And kale is the best. So if you're gonna be a good person, you better be eating freaking kale. I mean, it's ludicrous, but we've bought into this. And so now all of a sudden, kale, because we started to highlight its protein, its iron, the low level of calories, the food industry decided to make kale popular. There's actually a woman um, who, her name is, let me see, uh, Oberon Sinclair, and she was the person who decided to make kale famous. And in the US, kale production increased by nearly 60% between 2007 and 2012. And the reason I bring this up is because no longer is it like, oh, what does my body want? Am I feeling kale? Am I feeling spinach? Am I feeling collards? All of a sudden, because of advertising, because of money that is driven, all of a sudden we need to eat kale. And kale is better. And because we're eating kale, now we're better. And all the different, you know, kale is sexy. Don't get me started on that one, okay? Um, but we have this, this weird relationship where food has, has shifted from it just being food. Like that we can just eat and that we can trust our bodies to all these numbers, all this morality added to it. Um, Lisa, you're like, this is just crazy. Uh, Renee, you said, uh, it's the all or nothing issue with me. Need to listen to my body. Am I hungry, thirsty, or avoiding something else entirely? Yes, I love that you brought that up. Yeah, paying attention to your hunger, paying attention to your fullness, to your emotions as it relates to food. And being like, am I getting triggered emotionally somewhere? And is that making me eat these forbidden foods? And anytime something is forbidden, y'all, what's going to happen? We're going to want it more. Anytime anything is forbidden, you think about sex. And now we have sex plus food. Like I think about the Burger King commercials and it's like, um, the woman who's got like, you know, her bikini on and like the water spraying on her face and it's like, you know, and she eats this Big Mac. And it's like, all right, get a grip, people. Or people talking about um, advertising healthy foods. And it's, you know, someone in a skimpy outfit who is the quote unquote picture of health. But all of thing, these things are forbidden. So it might be this sexy woman holding up um, Diet Coke or Coke Zero. And all of a sudden we have this you know, it's okay to indulge because it's guilt free and we've linked sex with it. So then it gets all wonky up there. And this guilt that we attach to food, this concept of cheating, this concept of being bad, of falling off the wagon or getting off track, makes all those forbidden foods more alluring, more tempting. And so that the minute that we give in to this temptation, then we're overrun with shame. And it's our fault. It's our fault. We start blaming ourselves, we, our lack of control, our lack of willpower, and we have sinned. We have sinned when we give in to our forbidden foods. And then we have to do penance. So we must repent, and that's when we vow to go on our next diet. And we must be cleansed, we must be washed, we must be detoxed, we must be saved to basically earn our cultural diet, uh, diet culture salvation. And in our culture, that looks like losing weight. 
That's the salvation. That's the, the transformation from this horrible, sinful person who gives into the temptation, who goes back into restriction, back into weighing and counting and having all these different fool, uh, food rules. And it is messed up, y'all. I hope that this is like eye-opening for you because it really is a messed up system. And all of this, let me just like, you know, put the lights on this, pay attention to this. All of this motivating people from shame, from guilt, is so that you buy the next trend, the next diet book, the next magazine, the next program, get the next surgery. It is all here to manipulate you that there's something broken inside of you, that you need fixing, that your body is unlike anybody else, that you're the only one who has saggy breasts. You're the only one who has a flabby stomach. You're the only one who has cellulite. You're the only one who has stretch marks. And how dare you? When the truth is, y'all, think about, side note, think about how many different breeds of dogs there are, okay? Sharpays, Labs, Golden Retrievers, um, German Short Hair Pointers, English Setters, all these different dogs, all have different features. Then you have these mutts who are, you know, hybrids. It is the same for people. It is the same for people. There are all different shapes and sizes and body types and um, genetic diversity that's going on. And yet we pretend that we're, you know, we're marketed to as if you're the only one who's got the problem and you better fix it quick because that means you're on good behavior. So if we believe that we are broken, if we believe that we are sinful, not to be trusted around food, then we're gonna give our power over to anyone who might have the answer or might have the solution and, and give a lot of money to that. Uh, you guys are like, yes, this is so crazy. Uh, anybody have any thoughts on that? Anybody have any comments? Anybody have any, like Lisa saying, this has been going on since she was a teenager, have any experiences of that? Where you're like, oh my God, yes, I've been doing this for a long time. I first remember doing this in fifth grade going on my first diet in fifth grade, cabbage soup diet. Um, so this shame, this guilt is a really powerful motivator based around mobilizing the shame and attaching it to how we consume food and move our bodies. So my solution is we have got to forget everything that we have learned about food. We have got to ditch all of the diet culture rules, and we have to get back to seeing food as neutral, as just simply food. And when we give up dieting, we take back something we were often too young to know we had given away, our own voice, our ability to make decisions about what to eat and when, our belief in ourselves, our right to decide what goes into our mouths. And for me, I really want to help y'all shift out of this disordered diet mentality thinking that we've normalized to help us get back to what actually is real normal eating, where food is neutral, where we can trust our bodies. And so I've come up with three questions that you can begin to ask yourself as you start getting curious to see, okay, how deep is this for me? How deep into diet mentality am I? How deep are these fears around my body? How much have I bought into the belief of guilt and shame and good behavior and bad behavior and good foods and bad foods? So here are my three questions. So question number one, just to get curious, is what foods are on my naughty list? <laughs> what foods are on my naughty list? Where, what foods are forbidden for you? What foods are unhealthy? What foods are bad? What foods feel sinful? What foods uh, would you say that you cheat on or feel afraid to potentially cheat on? And then the second question is, what foods do, you th what foods do I think are healthy? What are my sanctioned foods? What are my good foods? What are my approved foods? What are my healthy foods? What foods have I identified as good or better than other foods? You know, like looking at, okay, well, kale is a, is a healthier food than spinach. 
or you know what are the, what are the healthy things um, that you have identified in your life? And then the last and third question is, what food rules do I have? When I think about food, what rules have I put on eating, on food? I can't eat past a certain time. I can't eat more than X amount of calories. If I eat this, I then need to do this workout. You know, I can't eat more. I have to eat half of my food. I'm not allowed to eat this. You know, what food rules do you have? And I encourage you to, to you know, screenshot this because you may want to take this as an invitation to journal and to start getting curious about what some of these um, uh, some of these things that you've been thinking about as it relates to diet culture, what are your good foods, what are your bad foods, and what rules have you created? And I love these stories, you guys, that you're sharing. Um, Lisa, you said naughty, bread, pasta, most all carbs, bad. Samantha, sugar, cheese, white bread, pasta. Trisha, you said, oh, where to begin with the, the bad food list? Too many to, to list. Yeah, we are so... Um, saturated with this morality that we've attached to food. I mean, it, it consumes every thought we think about food. Like we can't order from a restaurant without thinking, what's the good choice? What's the bad choice? Am I going to be good today? Or am I going to be bad today? We can't go to the grocery store without reading labels, making sure that those tick off all the right boxes, depending on what diet or um, diet behaviors we're practicing in the moment. Everything is good or bad. We are going to be either good or bad. And y'all, that is not truth. That is not normal. And I, you know, I, I hesitate even using the word normal because that can be a triggering word. But basically, like, that's not common sense eating. That's fear-based eating. That's eating informed by a 60 plus billion dollar diet industry who's making sure that we would prefer kale over spinach, or that we do the Whole30 over Atkins. You know, there is a $60 billion marketing budget here going into making sure that we make the right good decision so that we're the right good woman versus making the bad decisions. And there's a whole marketing about people uh, playing to that temptation. Oh, just give in a little bit. You know, just, just enjoy this. Get your pleasure back. Ooh, it's so crazy. So let's take a look at what normal eating is. So normal eating is eating when you are hungry. Eating when you are hungry. Normal eating is stopping when you're full. So when you're not in this last supper, kind of behavior and I got to get it all in or you're not in this uh, buffering your life with food or coping through emotional eating because you don't want to deal with what's up here. So you go to a secondary issue and you start eating to numb out the intense emotions. So when you have that ability to sit with food, you stop when you're full. You allow yourself to eat when you're hungry. You give your permission to eat anytime you're hungry, even if it's seven times a day, if it's biological hunger. And you stop when you're full, not feeling like you have to be part of the clean plate club, where you can leave food on your plate because you're not desperate about, I'm not gonna be able to eat this again. You know, that I'm, this is the last time I get to eat chocolate cake, so I have to eat the entire piece of chocolate cake. You know, or this is the last time that I'm gonna eat carbs before I go back to being good. So I better eat all the rolls in the bread basket. You know, normal eating is not having that deprivation, uh, oh gosh, this is about to go away, where you can listen to your body and you can eat when you're hungry and you stop when you're full. No, you can go back anytime to go get some more of whatever it is that you're eating or order more or make more. That there, it's always going to be available, that it's not going to be going away because you're going on the next diet. That's normal. Normal eating kind of like common sense eating, is being able to slow down when you eat, where you taste your food. You chew your food. You put your fork down in between bites and you really go, oh my God, that is so delicious. That is so good. And you give yourself permission to enjoy your food. Taste it. 
feel it in your mouth, feel the texture, feel the taste. Like, ooh, I love that. Or like, ooh, I don't really want any more of that. But you slow down to experience your food. That's normal. What's not normal is when you are shoveling in all the food so fast that you're not tasting it because you're so afraid that you're gonna get caught for being bad or that you better eat it before it's all gone or that you better hurry up to you know, numb out. You know, normal eating is tasting, enjoying, finding pleasure in your food. Normal eating um, is treating all foods as equals. Okay, so let's have a moment of that. Treating all food as equal. So your food becomes neutral. There's no morality attached to food. There's no more good food. There's no more bad food. You're eating without rules. So you can eat past five o'clock, you can eat, you know, you're, you're not counting calories, there's none of that. You're eating without rules and you're tuning into your body, you're simply eating. Like there's peace there. There's really beautiful peace there when it comes to food. And normal eating is intuitively listening to your body and honoring what it's asking for. So I teach intuitive eating, I teach normal eating in my course, and I encourage my students to begin checking in with their body, and so they eat a meal, and without zero judgment, their meal was neither good nor bad, they just check in and say, hey, how do I feel after I ate this? Does this give me energy? Do I, you know, how are my joints? How does my stomach feel? Does it make me tired? Does it make my joints ache? You know, really tapping into what your body is telling you and honoring it. And so that the normal way of eating is you can have a green juice, you can have a cookie, you can have nachos, you can have quinoa, you can have kale, you can have pizza, whatever. It, there's no good or bad foods. And for me, I eat nachos a couple times a week. My body loves that with some delicious black beans and some cheese. My body also loves acai bowls and green juice. I mean, like I am all over the map, but I'm not worried about cheating or this meal doing something bad to me or good or bad foods. I'm just listening intuitively to my body. And I know that for me, like gluten makes me hurt. If I pass a certain threshold, I can eat it sometimes, but there's a point where it starts to inflame my body. And that's not making gluten bad. It's just that that doesn't work well with my chemistry of my body. So I'm taking the morality out of it and tapping into my body. And as we go through my Facebook Lives week to week, we'll get into more of this. I'll teach you more about this. And of course, my course really goes into depth about all of this. Um, so I just really want to begin to help you normalize the good kind of normal, the common sense kind of normal. Normalize your eating so that you're not weighing and measuring and counting and avoiding and restricting and skipping, but that you are really coming into more trust. So you're taking the morality out. You realize that there is a 60 plus billion dollar industry happening that's like playing to your emotions that you can kind of extract yourself from that and begin to tune in and listen to your body and find pleasure in your food again without all the guilt, without all of the shame and that is normal eating, when you have peace around food, where you're not obsessing about it. And so I hope that this has been just like a little crack for your door, just opening up just enough for maybe the fact that you start to get curious, maybe you start to explore what your food rules are, what foods you think are good and bad, and start to challenge them. You start maybe following the money to see, okay, why is this advertised this way? You start hearing and picking up when your friends are stuck in that diet culture thinking and giving yourself permission that you don't have to play that game anymore, that you can begin to start a relationship of trusting your body and trusting yourself around food and seeing your voice as the most important voice when it comes to the health of your body more than anyone else, more than a doctor, more than a book, more than a reality show TV um, star, more than a magazine that your voice is the most important. Um, so I, I just am grateful that you've even allowed yourself to get curious and maybe start thinking about food and your relationship to it in a different way. And as you guys know, I am going to be on here every single week. I have some fabulous
fabulous shows planned for you for the remainder of the year. I even have a holiday challenge coming up in December, which I can't wait to share with you. So I hope that you will tune in every week, one o'clock central to be with me and to remember that the purpose of life is to be grateful, to be great and to be full.